Lord, we are, we are thankful this morning. Worthy is the Lamb. We thank you for the salvation that you offer to us. We thank you for the forgiveness of the sins. We thank you, Father, that we can gather in this place to worship you. Father, I think of those that can't be here with us for one reason or another, that they're sick. Um, there are many that um, have needs right now in our congregation and in our community, and so I pray for healing uh, to come upon them. I also pray for the Vodari family as they grieve, and we pray that peace would be upon them in Jay's passing. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your love and mercy. And may, Father, we always choose to be faithful and thankful people. It's in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm thankful for our country. I'm thankful for the opportunities that America has provided to so many people. I'm thankful for the wisdom of our founding fathers. I'm thankful for our Constitution which provides the framework so that we can correct our ways when we get out over our skis. And there have been many times in our history where we've had to make corrections. I'm thankful for the balance of power that the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. We have so much to be thankful for in our country. And we forget that sometimes. There are times where, you, you know if you pay attention to my social media feed, I, I can be really hard on our country. I really can be. But that's because I love it so much. I want my children, I want my children's children to enjoy this great land and the opportunities that are set before us. I want them to experience that wealth of opportunity that this country affords to so many people. Does America have its failings? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We've not done everything right. We have so many problems that stem from corrupt politician, idiotic policies, governmental overreach. We, we don't always live up to our ideals. And when we fail, we need to correct our failings. But we don't throw out everything that we believe in or our values. We work to correct the things that we're doing wrong. W.A. Criswell, he wrote this. He said, Our nation was built upon a prayer-answering God. If you have been to Valley Forge, you have seen there a heroic statue of General George Washington kneeling in intercession. After our Declaration of Independence in July of 1776, the following dark winter in Valley Forge, waiting, facing almost inevitable defeat, in 1777, the general, down on his knees, imploring the mercies and the help of God. Ten years later, in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, 55 brave men met together to form the constitution of this new, and I would say God-blessed America. On the table, in front of the presiding officer, was a book. There's one book. It was the Bible. A stranger from afar, he asked the people that were there, he said, which one of these men is George Washington? And the man replied, when the assembly goes to prayer, the one who kneels will be General George Washington. And seeking an avenue, an instrument guarding the rights and privileges of the people against tyranny and oppression, our founders fought, uh, or sought a model in the governments of the world. They looked to Spain, where there they found the rights and privileges were guaranteed by a monarchy. But our founding fathers thought if, if a monarchy can grant the rights and privileges, that same monarchy can take them away. And so uh, they turned to England. And there they found the rights and privileges were founded in a parliament. But, said our founding fathers, if a parliament can grant rights and privileges, then that same parliament can take them away. Then they turned to France. And they found that the rights and privileges were guaranteed by a majority. But, said our founding fathers, if a majority can grant rights and privileges, that same majority can also take them away. It was then that our founding fathers turned to Almighty God and found in his omnipotent creation that we are in God's sight rights, privileges, endowments that were granted by God himself. 
and in his sight we are all created free and equal. This is the God to whom our forefathers sought the blessings of the foundation of America. It's a nation that's founded upon the Christian home and the Christian church. There's not a school child today that doesn't realize that the conquistadors, they came to America seeking gold. But the Puritans, our Puritan forefathers, came to this land seeking God. And the nation they built is great because of their consecrated devotion to the same Lord and God in heaven. Because if a nation were made great by vast expansion, one would say that perhaps Siberian Russia would be the greatest in the world. If a nation was made great by vast resources, you may make the argument that Brazil is, could be the greatest nation in the world. If a nation were made great by vast population, you would say India could be the greatest nation in the world. If a nation was made great by ancient civilization, you could even say China is the greatest nation in the world. But a nation is made great not by vast fertile acres, but by the men who till them. A nation is, is not made great by vast forests, but by the people who use them. A nation is not made great by rich mines, but by the people who work in them. A nation is not made great by a transportation system, but by the people who build them. It was Lyman Abbott who said this, America was a great land when Columbus discovered it, but Americans have made of it a great nation because it is founded upon God, upon the church, and upon the Christian home. This text we're going to look at this morning is found in the book of Psalms, and we're going to look at just one verse. This morning I'm going to use the English Standard Version. Normally I use the, the CSB Version, but this morning I'm using a different translation of the Scriptures because I think it draws out a little bit closer to the original Hebrew what was being said. Hebrews cha uh, Psalm chapter 33 and verse 12 says this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Let me read that again. I want you to think about it. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And, and unfortunately on the screen here, it doesn't bring it out as well as it should. That word Lord should be in all caps because that's God's proper name. That's the names that you see here on the walls around you. That's Yahweh. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Originally, there would be no question that these verses refer to the nation of Israel. God chose and continues to choose Israel to be his own possession. Of this there can be no doubt. The Jewish people are precious to God, and, and so they should be precious to everyone who calls himself a follower of God. There's no room for anti-Semitism in the church of God. God has chosen the Jewish nation. But by his grace, he has grafted into his vine Gentiles through the establishment of the church. The church is God's possession. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the flock of God. We are his people. This word nation in Psalm 33, 12 is defined as, as, a, as people who are bound together by various cultural, physical, or geographical ties. That's kind of the definition that we're using here of nation. It's people who are bound together by various cultural, physical, or geographical ties. So if, if we insert that concept into this verse, we start to gain a clearer picture of what is being said by the psalmist. Blessed. Another word for blessed is happy. Blessed or happy is the group of people who are bound together by various cultural, physical, or geographical ties whose God is Yahweh and who have been chosen by God to be his possession. So now with that understanding of this verse, we're, we're in a position where we can start to ask ourselves some, some questions. Are we a group of people who are bound together whose God is Yahweh? Have we been chosen by God to be his possession? Well, let's consider this first concept. Are we a nation? Are we a nation? 
Are we a group of people who are bound together? Well, at times in our history, we were bound together as a nation. That's true. There were times we came together, we rallied around a cause, but I think if we were to really be honest in considering our, our country, we would have to say those national bonds are pretty weak. There's a major problem with our leadership. We are struggling as a nation to find our way together. And it's our politicians, our I even hesitate to use the term leader these days, but our politicians exploit our differences to try and wedge us apart because there's something that we know. A divided people is a weak people. It seems as if we don't always share the same culture. It seems as if we do not have the, the, the physical ties and the geographical ties because of being spread out. It's hard to find the cohesion. So what does this mean? Well, it means we need to forge new bonds. That's what it means. It means we need to create community and culture. And as the local church, it, it starts with us. It starts with us. America was founded on Christian homes and Christian churches. And so we must prioritize being present with each other every opportunity that we have. We cannot, please hear me when I say this, we cannot continue to neglect gathering together with one another. We must prioritize being with each other every opportunity that we have. We must build, create, and develop our community of faith. We have to prioritize the development of our community of faith. Because if we're going to experience God's blessings, we must bond together and form a growing, vibrant community of faith. This was Jesus' prayer in the book of John. This is what he prayed for us. He prayed that we would be one as he was one with the Father and the Spirit. So what does this look like? Well, it means that we share meals together. It means that our children should learn together and play together. It means that we need to do things together. We need to celebrate together. Blessed is the nation. Blessed is the, is the group of people who are bound together. But the psalmist doesn't stop there. There's a, there's a blessing in being together. We start there. But the psalmist set some other parameters that must also be true. He said, blessed is the nation, blessed is the group of people who are bound together, whose God is Yahweh. Blessed is the group of people who are bound together, whose God is Yahweh. So let's ask that question. Is Yahweh our God? Who is America's God? The bottom line is that Americans have become a people of depravity and debauchery. It is hard to listen to the news with my children present because of the reports of just the lawlessness and the evil among the American people. I'm sure I don't have to list specifics because you know, as soon as I say those words, things just start flashing into your mind. America is a drug addicted nation. People are abusing drugs in record numbers. Sexual immorality and deviance of all manner of speaking is celebrated. We just experienced this massive depravity on display during the so-called Pride Month. It was just disgustingness of all manner of evil of speaking. Sodomites, sexual deviants and groomers, they destroy the moral fabric of our nation. Families are being ripped apart. Crime and violence, they plague our cities. Our public school system is failing our children and exposing them to all manner of evil. Religious abuse and cults abound. Even in our pulpits and seminaries, leftists are teaching and espousing the teachings of Marxism and critical race theory and the homosexual agenda and all these other evil philosophies. What does this mean? Well, it means that I would be hard-pressed to say that the God of the Bible is America's God. It means we more than ever, must be sure that Yahweh is our God. Is Yahweh the God of this community of faith? And before you quickly say yes, take a moment. Is Yahweh the God of your life? Is Yahweh the God of your life? 
We will not be blessed if Yahweh is not our God. Are we doing what he says to do? And are we doing what he wants done? Are you living life for any other reason than the glory of God? Because if you are, then Yahweh is not your God. Be sure Yahweh is your God. Be sure Yahweh is your God. What does it look like when Yahweh is your God? Well, it means doing what God has called you to do. That's what it means. It means obeying the great commandment, the great commission. It means prioritizing worship and Bible study and prayer and other spiritual disciplines. It means going where God says to go. It's a call to unquestioning obedience. We need to return to God. We need revival. We need an outpouring of God's spirit on his people. We need God's people to be sure that Yahweh is their God. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh. Blessed are the people who are chosen, who God has chosen to be his possession. So here's the third question. Has God chosen us to be his possession? The beauty of, of this question is that it actually doesn't depend on our action or activity. This is all about God's will and decision. And I want you to know this and be confident of this. The answer to this question is a resounding yes. Yes. God has chosen us to be his possession. At this point in redemptive history, by the grace of God, he has made the way for all people to be his people. Through Jesus Christ, the invitation is open to be God's people. John 3, 16 through 18, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Romans 10, 9-13, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Going back to the verse this morning. Blessed, happy is a nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen to be his possession. And so we prioritize the development of our community of faith. We work to be sure that Yahweh is our God. Be sure Yahweh is your God. He has called us to be his people. So what that means is this. We can experience the blessings of God. That's what that means. We can experience the blessings of God. We can be a blessed people. We hear of what's going on in our country, and, and we should mourn. We see those gratuitous displays of evil and depravity and debauchery and decadence. I, I've, I've actually heard it said that God owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology um, he, if he allows us to survive while destroying them. And sometimes when I see these displays of evil in our country, I think the same thing. But then I have to come to my sentence and realize it isn't true. It isn't true. God gave Sodom and Gomorrah an opportunity for repentance, and they rejected it. God's judgment didn't come upon them until every opportunity to return to righteousness had been exhausted. If you remember the whole Adam and God, uh, uh, what do we say, bartering system, you know, there wasn't even 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. 
not even Lot's immediate household. This isn't true of us. We still have an opportunity to return. We still have an opportunity for blessing. And so as Irving Berlin wrote, God, bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night when it's dark, when it's really hard, when we seem to have lost our way, when we're not going in the right direction. Guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God, bless America, my home, sweet home. I believe that God is still calling to us. I believe that God is still calling to America. I believe that God is still calling to his church. He has made the way. And he calls for people everywhere to receive his gift of salvation. He calls us to flee the path of destruction and to walk the way of life. And so blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Perhaps you've never made that decision to follow Christ. You've never decided to give Jesus control of your life. And right now you're just living for whatever makes you happy. You're running from one relationship to the next, or one experience to the next, or one, one promise to the next, but you just can't find that joy, that hope, that satisfaction, that happiness that just seems to elude you because you're trying to find it apart from Jesus Christ. And as we've been looking at this morning, you will never be blessed. You will never be happy. You will never find what you're looking for unless you give your life to Jesus. Unless you place your faith in him. He has made the way. You can have hope and peace. Jesus, the son of God, he took on flesh and he came to earth. He lived a sinless life. And then Jesus, who is without sin, became sin for us. There's so much that we could talk about that and the miracle and the, and the way that all happened. But when he did this, God the Father looked away. And Jesus, for the first time, experienced being alone. And if you remember, if you've read the story on the cross, he cried out in anguish, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't because of the torture of the cross that he cried that out. It's because he felt the separation that sin brought. And Jesus never walked away while being, built, while being beaten. He never called on the hosts of heaven while being tortured. He never called off the mission. He endured all of this because he loves us. Because he loves us. Jesus endured all that pain because our sins separate us from him. And he didn't want that. So in his love and mercy, Jesus endured the pain of the cross. He shed his blood for you. And when you call on his name, Every sin that you've committed will be forgiven and you'll be made clean. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. I would urge you this morning, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus this morning. Acknowledge your need for God's forgiveness from your sins. Experience his forgiveness. He loves you. That's you. You've never made that decision. You've never decided to follow Jesus. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sins. Make me clean. I acknowledge Jesus as my Savior and the Lord of my life. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, before we close this time of reflection, I would ask you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed during this time. During this time of reflection, let's just take some time. In just a few minutes, we'll be 
observing communion together, so you want to take some time to reflect on that as well. During this time, pray for our country. Pray for our community. Pray for our families. God is still calling. He's not done yet. And the reason why I know that is because we're still here. So let's commit to prioritizing, developing our community of faith. Let's be sure that God is in his rightful place as Lord of our life. Let's take a few moments before we observe the Lord's Supper together to, to reflect, spend time with the Lord in prayer.